whatever the cause, when disaster strikes, someone will be first on the scene. It could be you. What are your first steps going to be? Joe Mazio is a National Park Service structural fire officer. In any emergency situation, the most important thing is uh, to do a, a size up, analyze what's happening at the moment, and what steps you can take then, or what steps need to be taken with, uh, with the assistance of others. So you'd be looking at uh, what type of resources you'd need, uh, and generally, the uh, key people that would be involved in the emergency plan would be your maintenance or facilities people, because they're more familiar with uh, the structure, with gas, electricity, water, and those types of utilities. So they'd be important to notify. Note these two important points. Shutting off or finding someone to shut off systems that may lead to greater danger, especially gas and electricity. And notification. If you have fire, of course, you'll call the fire department. You'll also go into the emergency plan and start notifying the key people. Soon, people start arriving on the scene. Where do they go? If you are the first person on scene using the uh, incident command system, which most emergency services use, uh, you are the incident commander at the time. And basically, you're at the incident command post. Uh, as resources come in, as you're called key people, you may want to move that site to a remote location so you're not intimately involved with the incident. But, uh, you know, remove it, uh, move it to a location where you have phones, fax machines. Okay, Internal so communications is really important in any incident. Uh, you'll have multiple disciplines involved between maintenance, interpretation, curatorial, administrative staff, and it's important that the good communications are, have, are taking place um, so there isn't a miscommunication of what the intent or what the priorities are. Depending on the severity of the incident, there may be extensive interest from external sources such as the media and the public. So it's important that one individual be appointed to provide information to the different uh, sources requesting information uh, regarding the incident. It's almost impossible to overemphasize the importance of communication in an emergency situation. Even after the danger has passed, there's the potential for chaos. A lot of people may be present. Most are in a new situation. Emotions may be running high and everyone wants to help. It's critical that everyone know what the plan of action is, where they fit in, and how the work is progressing. Communications need to be as simple as possible, and they need to flow in both directions. One other point about avoiding chaos. One of the first things you must do in any emergency is to secure the area. The local police, when they arrive, will be able to set up a secure perimeter. This is done for safety to enable recovery work to proceed in an orderly manner and to ensure that a natural disaster in one part of the facility doesn't turn into the opportunity for grand larceny in another part. Now, once the perimeter is established, only people who are authorized and who need to be there should be inside the perimeter. You'll need to set up a system for checking people in and out so the incident commander knows at all times who is at the site. As we move ahead now, we're going to take a lot of examples from a training exercise conducted by the National Park Service, in which a mock disaster in a non-historic structure demonstrates how a fire might start in an historic property, what happens when firefighters put it out, and how to deal with the aftermath. When you get your first look at your collection after a disaster, your reaction may well be one of shock. You're going to have to focus and make a rational assessment of what's happened and what you're going to do today to minimize the damage. Start with your list of priority items. What needs immediate attention to prevent further damage? What steps should you take to protect them? What can be left in place and what needs to be moved? Then you'll start getting into the rest of the contents, not only the collection, but also the records and other contents of the building. Great. Okay. And we can move the top off and see how wet it is. Now, actually, the material in here is actually quite dry. The box is quite soaked. If we try to move the box, uh, I think what's going to happen is that it's going to fall apart on us. So transfer but the material transfer into Transfer the material box. into another box. 
um, it is quite dry and we're going to be able then to support it and then uh, if necessary freeze it if only because of the fact that that gives us a lot of time to work on it. Before you move anything, even to a nearby box, you'll need to make a record of what it is and where it came from. Then you have to decide how to treat each object that is salvaged. With paper, the options include air drying and freezing. You already have priorities regarding the importance of objects and records. You're also going to need to prioritize according to which objects need the most immediate attention to prevent further damage. Any prioritization been done? Uh, at this point, at this point, I would say uh, photographs. Uh, get the photographs taken care of. Then photographs are going to be the probably the key because they're the ones that, that are not going to respond to, they respond to water much more quickly than anything else, okay? You've also got some colored materials here, uh, some of which appears to be on coated paper, uh, which means that if it starts to dry, it's going to fuse together. Uh, so you want to make sure you're dealing with that and, and interleave the materials, because otherwise what happens, either that or separate them completely and let them dry completely on their own. As you go along, you're going to adjust your pre-established priorities list in light of the situation. You may find, for example, that the top priority objects are all safe or easily moved. And the new top priority is to remove books and financial records that are rapidly soaking up water. Remember, one principle of disaster planning is to be flexible. You're moving a lot of material out of harm's way, and naturally, you're going to need a place to put it. If the incident is limited to a small area, you may be able to keep everything in the building. But if damage is widespread, as in this exercise involving a fire, you're going to have to remove objects from the building to a site that is ideally nearby and definitely secure. You'll coordinate security with local law enforcement officials. You have a lot to do in the salvage area, and it has to be well organized. Here, you'll be able to more carefully assess objects' conditions and decide where they'll be sent. Initial steps can be taken to stabilize objects that are wet or damaged. Everything will have to be inventoried and tagged. Okay, now put it down all together. Easy. To do the work, your salvage area will need plastic sheeting to keep objects off the ground, tables for small objects, fans, if you have a power supply, to help dry objects, cloths and paper towels for blotting up moisture, and tags for labeling. Okay, they need to have numbers. They go to that triage center over there where the big target is. In a major incident like this, you may have a lot of objects being dispersed for storage or restoration. Careful record keeping at the salvage site will go a long way to ensuring that you don't lose track of objects and in the end, you get everything back. The first rule of salvage is don't move things that don't need to be moved. If an object is undamaged and the area is stable and secure, leave the object alone. Check to make sure that security will be maintained around the clock. When you're considering collections, you'll give priority to undamaged items that are threatened by unstable conditions. For some objects, such as paintings and old furniture, extreme humidity and heat may constitute a threatening condition that may require removal of the object. Keep in mind, too, that you may have objects on loan from individuals or other institutions. You have a special obligation to protect these objects. When it comes to materials that have suffered damage from water, smoke, falling debris, or whatever, there's a great temptation to improve their situation. Don't. It's counterintuitive, but often the best thing you can do in the short run is to leave objects in the condition in which you found them. Some wet objects, like these audio and video tapes, are best if they're kept wet until they can be properly dried. Improper drying at this point will do more damage than the water has done. At this point, we can actually immerse this if necessary, because uh, since it does seem to be fairly clean, 
and then it can be checked with a uh, an audio so company. We probably should get some buckets of clean water. Yeah, and some be buckets able to of set clean up water to be able to put these up. Facility, right? Like okay. And the same thing in relation to the discs, we can put them in trays again in water because that's going to make the big difference. With broken objects, retrieve all the pieces and label them. While the effects of fire and water, either from fire hoses or from a storm, are dramatically evident, you have to keep in mind the more subtle yet pervasive kind of damage that can be caused by an abrupt climate change inside your building. There's a good chance your climate control system has shut down. You may have broken windows or other ways in which the envelope has been broken. Now this is a perfect opportunity for mold to start growing and you want to get the building back to normal temperature and humidity as soon as possible. Until you do and even after return to normal, check daily for mold. If you find mold starting to grow on an object, isolate it.